Ladies and gentlemen, it's the Too High Podcast with Seth Galina and Deontay Lee. I don't know why I started like that. I'm excited because we have on one of my best friends in the whole entire world, uh, Mr. Steven Ruiz is with us. Steven, uh, Steven Ruiz of The Ringer. Steve, That's what's right. going on? Not much. I'm, I'm honored to be on this podcast. I'm humbled by it. <laughs> I, always, I never understand when people like win an award and they're like, I'm humbled by this. What, why? Shouldn't you be the opposite of humbled by winning an award? Oh, it's just the easiest lie to tell in the world. Hey, while everybody's staring at me and I've achieved my greatest successes, I would like you to know that I am also more humble than you. Not only am I better than you, <laughs> I am better handling my success than you would be. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, it's like fake humility, almost. Mm-hmm. Um, Steven, you went to the Wizards game last night. I did. Let's do a little chit-chat before we get into some football. What's going on? What happened at the Wizards game last night? It was a great game. It was a great game. It was a high-scoring game. The Wizards lost by one point. Kyle Kuzma had two chances at the buzzer to win the game, at least of, from what I remember. I, I might have had a drink or two at, <laughs> before the game. <laughs> but he missed both shots. But I, I bet on the Wizards, and I got a point and a half, so I won my bet. There you go. Hey, the, all that matters is covering. That's right. And James You're... Harden James Harden looks very fat for an NBA <laughs> player, I mean, <laughs> relatively speaking. I was very surprised. Um, all right, that's enough basketball talk. Let's start with football, and let's start with the Tennessee Titans and the Cincinnati Bengals who are playing against each other in Nashville. You wrote about the – on the ringer.com, you wrote about the Tennessee Titans offense and defense. So we'll start there. I guess the big question is like – you know, the big macro question is like, hey, what can this off? Is this offense still the same with or without Derrick Henry? Uh, what is the difference without him since he's been out? And what does that mean for, for this game? Yeah, I th- like when the Titans offense is at its best, since Tannehill has taken over as quarterback, they've always been hitting play action passes over the middle. And when Henry was out, and I don't know, maybe it wasn't Henry being out, maybe it was just coincidence, but we can't say that they weren't accessing the middle of the field on those play action passes. And as a result, the play action passing game wasn't as effective down to down. Like overall, if you look at the numbers, they were actually better at play action based on EPA without Henry. But that's just because there was two interceptions that cost them like 15 points of EPA and four sacks that cost them another 12 points. And they had the same sack rates and the same interception rates, but they were less costly. There was like five EPA lost and like six. So I think that was the big difference in getting Henry back Getting Julio back, getting AV or AJ Brown back. I think they're ready to take off and be the offense we thought they were going to be before the season started. So for me, like it, it's actually kind of um, soothing to hear that because I've had no feel for this team basically since the Rams game on Sunday night where they just beat the hell out of the Rams with the turnovers early um, and they weren't able to get back in the game because they really like hit a cold spell, you know, in that kind of mid season to late season stretch. Um, What do you think was the issue there with them? And did they get it fixed before guys are getting healthy? Or are we making an assumption that, you know, now that they've got their guys back, you know, the run game, the explosive plays and the things that we've kind of known this offense to be, will be okay again. Yeah, so in the article, I basically broke the season down into four uh, phases. The first game was, or the first phase was that Arizona game, which I really would throw out just because of how bad it was for them, start to finish. Mm-hmm. But from weeks two to eight, they looked like a good offense. They were like top eight in DVOA. They were, they looked like a top ten NFL team. But then they started getting hurt. Right. Henry got hurt. AJ Brown got hurt. Julio got Julio hurt. Julio was hurt. Yeah. And from weeks 9 to 12, that's when they really struggled and they lost some games. I think they lost to the Texans during that stretch. And the receivers have kind of been out in and out of the lineup, A.J. Brown and Julio, but they started to get a little bit healthy towards the end. And we saw Tannehill kind of take off. Like he had, I think he was like top five in EPA per play over the last three weeks. So we're starting to see signs. Now we haven't seen Henry, Brown, and Jones on the field at once together in the second half. They only played 120 snaps together during the regular season. And only one time did they play 40 snaps in a game together, and that was in week two. So, like I said in the article, like I don't know what to expect out of this offense. We can't really predict what the ceiling is, but we know that they're going to be better because having good players makes playing football easier. Right. Is there anything that you can point to in 
their issues within being able not to hit the middle of the field. Because like you like like you're saying, and something that we've talked about a lot is like the Titans' offense is is entirely and not entirely based, but mostly based on downhill play action, and I think specifically, um, you know, duo play action rather than a, a rather than like a, a horizontal stretch run play, a more of a vertical downhill stretch run run play, and then hitting these inbreakers behind, him, whether that's a a slant, a five yard in, or the uh, the famous glance post route. Um, that they run to both those guys. And, and, you know, them getting Julio at the beginning of the season was so interesting because, or in the off season was so interesting because we're talking about A.J. Brown, who you could argue was the best, like, in-breaking wide receiver in, in the game right now. And then Julio Jones, who obviously is one of the most complete wide receivers, uh, but, also, but specifically one of the best in-breaking wide receivers of the last, let's say, 20 years or of all time. So that was super interesting to see how, how they could pair those those two skill sets together in that there there's some similarities there. So yeah, anyways, getting back to the question, is like, is there anything that you saw um, where you're like, okay, well, what's going, like, why isn't this not happening anymore for them in the way that we kind of thought they would? And in a way that, you know, you talk about that, that game where they played 40 snaps together, that was the Seahawks game. We, we did see a lot of that stuff. We saw the way that they were able to combine both those players. Yeah, I think – well, I think it's just not having good players because those are tough catches to make over the middle. I think that was part of it. I think that they're not running as much duo as they did last year with Henry out, which gets the defense to react differently and you different voids in the zones when you run different types of play action. I think that had a lot to do with it. And there's no way of, like, quantifying this, but when you watch the film, it may be – it's just my – my, I'm trying to confirm my priors, but the linebackers just seem to react differently when Henry's out there. Like they run to the ball and try to get downhill compared to when Foreman's out there. I don't think they're as gung ho about defending the run. And I don't have any like stats that back that up, but that's just what I saw. And based on the stats that I do have, it seems like that had some type of effect. And having Henry out there does open up the middle of the field. Well, I mean, looking at the chart that you posted about EPA per play, like, and this is one of the reasons why I've had no feel for them um, is the fact that they've only had like 26 plays where they're all, all, or the 26 plays that you measure where they were all on the field, their EPA per play was like double what it was when any one of them were missing, you know, let alone when multiple guys were missing. So, you know, and this was one of the things that I was really interested in all year was, you know, Seth and I kind of talked about how with having Julio there, they basically have a guy in every role when everybody's healthy, short of like their loss of Johnny Smith, right? Like, and I'm sure that losing one of those guys really exposed, you know, not having that guy to work those intermediate to, to short areas. Uh, but with these guys left, like, are you looking at some of the data and some of their explosiveness when they were rolling and healthy as just high variance? Or is that actually what we can expect this offense to look like when everything's rolling. No. And the reason why I say, I mean, it's always hard with these small sample sizes. Right. But the reason why I say no is because that's how they want to play offense. So it makes sense that it was working at its best when those guys were on the, on the field and they were playing the roles that we expected them to play within the offense. So, uh, I mean, maybe it's the product of just a small sample size, but based on our, our ideas of what this offense could be, it makes sense. Right. Uh, okay, let's go to the defense now, and um, that's kind of something that I don't think a lot of people. Uh, maybe I'm wrong here. I don't want to generalize, but I feel like there's this idea that the Titans, because they're coached by Mike Vrabel, that they've been good on defense for like in his tenure, and they kind of haven't been. In fact, last year they were really bad on defense. Now this year, they're very good on defense. Finally. Um, Anything you see here, you know, when you look at the defense as, as a reason why, um, obviously the defensive line has played it pretty well in spurts, and and Kevin Byard was probably one of the best safeties in the league. Uh, he's always been, but he had another great year this year. Is and um, uh, so yeah, anything you see there when you when you look at them uh, on defense? Yeah, I was surprised at how fun it was to watch. I all three of us in in this have written Brandon Staley articles, and we all celebrated him last year. And I don't think Vrabel has. Vrabel and Shane Bowen, the defensive coordinator, have gotten enough credit for running a defense based on similar a similar philosophy. Like they are, they have they have one of the higher light box rates. They play two high safeties a lot more than most teams. 
they run a lot of creepers, a lot of sim pressures. They do a lot of coverage rotations. Uh, if they're if they're aligned one high pre snap, they they rotate to two high a lot, and vice versa. So they do a lot of stuff. They they do everything basically. And within their coverage families, there's so many variations. For that article, I, I posted a their cover two, uh, their different variations of cover two, or Tampa two. And for the first example, I wanted just a regular Tampa two coverage rep. I swear to God, it took me like an hour and a half just to find a regular one with the two safeties dropping deep and the Mike linebacker go, going up the hole. That's how much they they mess with quarterbacks. And that's really fascinating going up against this quarterback, Joe Burrow, who's one of the smarter quarterbacks before the snap and a guy that's taken full control of that offense before the snap. And really, whoever wins that chess match, and I'm inclined to give the advantage to the coaches just because they've been doing it longer. They're not second-year quarterbacks. So I'm leaning towards the Titans for this. But matchup. you also hate Joe Burrow, so I don't hate Joe Burrow. <laughs> I like making his jokes about his weak arm. I never said he was a bad quarterback. I always thought he was. I said he was the best player in the draft. Good Lord. All right, Colin. Whoa, 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 buddy. Whoa, whoa. All right. I'm, I'm re- you know, I'm yelling at you, Seth, but I'm really yelling at the Bengalorians. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I knew this was. I knew this was going to be mentioned at one point or another. So, you know, the things that you mentioned in the piece about this Titans defense, like the fact that they're not a heavy blitzing team, if they are sending a guy, it is like a sim pressure or a creeper where you're bringing a DB or a linebacker, dropping out a defensive end or a defensive tackle, whatever the case may be. Like, I'm really interested in looking at how this defense is going to perform against uh, a Joe Burrow and a Bengals offense that obviously wants to be really vertical, right? Like, and one of the things that we saw when – uh, the Bengals played the Raiders was what this offense looks like or how easy it is for us to lose its rhythm for quarters on end. Um, if they're not able to generate those explosive plays the way that they were able to in the first quarter against Vegas. So for a team in the Titans that, you know, is going to throw a lot more of like two high coverages, they're going to get a lot of depth, you know, in their zone drops and things like that. Is this going to be enough for a team that does not that maybe doesn't have like elite edge rush, but has been able to crush pockets and affect quarterbacks with this interior rushers. Is that going to be enough to kind of mess with the rhythm of the Bengals offense? I think so. I do wonder how, how much zone they're going to play just because Burrow. And I think against the Raiders, he did this a lot, how good he has been at hitting those underneath passes underneath the the zone droppers and he's done it with anticipation Uh, that touchdown i think it was against the raiders this past weekend when he threw that that touchdown to i think it was uzama he anticipated it was like a stop route if he's able to do that i think he can give the titans a lot of trouble and i think they'll have to mix some things up and probably play more man but that could be an issue too just because they leave their corners like on an island out there because their safeties are helping out on crossers a bunch and I don't know if you want to do if you want to leave uh, Jenkins, Janoris Jenkins, or Jack Rabbit Jenkins. I, I forgot he changed his name. One on one with Jamar Chase, and you know where Jenkins is going to be because he stays on the right side of the field. And that, as Seth tweeted this uh, this week, that's where the Bengals throw the ball a bunch. So I don't know. I I do I love this Titans defense. It's really fun to watch, and I think it's good. I just think this is the worst possible matchup for them because of those outside threats. Right. Yeah. Just a reminder that I tweeted that and not Nate Tice. Just put that out there. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I think this is this is a story where it's like you you want to do everything in your power to not play like the Las Vegas Raiders and Gus Bradley's defense against the Joe Burrow offense because they'll just throw to the sideline and they'll get you their one on ones and then if they're clicking, you're screwed. And for many games this year, they've been clicking on those on those sideline throws, especially Burrow and Chase, but even T. Higgins uh, when they do throw to him. So you you want to be in these situations where you're keeping two high safeties and being able to do that. Now the, the, the Bengals have had some success this year when they've said, okay, you want to play like that to, with a, a, against us? We can put in a heavier package and we can get into our like outside zone game from you know not with fullbacks, but they play with more like if they want to be like heavier they'll put in more tight ends and they've had some success and they haven't been great running the football recently um but i think if you want to play them like that um besides like you're talking about and just burrow being able to read the middle of the field and get balls off quickly i mean that's the number one thing but you can also get into this run game that that there's been games there there, there there's been there's been peaks at it where they, they've been really good at running the football against lighter boxes so you know definitely 
I don't think you want to play one on one. Though, and it's funny. I'm, I'm going to bring this up when we talk about the Packers and, and the 49ers. But sometimes I look at this stuff and I'm just like, you know, you could just play one on one, and maybe the Bengals or, or whoever team will just not have a good game throwing outside, and then you just win, right? Like just just like that. Even though it might not have been like the the quote unquote right game plan, but um, yeah. Anyways, I I think I think it's something that they will definitely try to start in in a too high type of situation, just because. The last tape you saw on the Bengals, the last tape you saw was them against Gus Bradley and everything went wrong for the most part, you know, in terms right. of throwing to the sideline and doing all the stuff you're supposed to do against cover three. So why but, do that again? And I think a big difference, and Burrow looks so comfortable throwing against that defense because he knew what he was getting pre-snap. I don't think he's going to have that luxury this time around, but if the Bengals do get into their their outside zone running game and they're able to run the ball, I think that makes it harder to run these sim pressures and these dis- the disguised coverages before the snap because you need guys in the spots right. they're supposed to be in before the snap. Right. And to answer, uh, I didn't really answer the second part of Deontay's question about the pass rush. I think it could be a bigger problem than it was against the Raiders, the, the pass protection unit for the Bengals, because I think this staff, like Dean Pease, when he was there two years ago, is very good at – they're running these, these simulated pressures – not necessarily to get a free runner, but to get a good matchup. And there are some good matchups on that Bengals offensive line. So they can get whoever they want on 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 that right side of the line. I think Jeffrey Simmons has a chance to really dominate this game if he gets enough help from Vrabel and Bowen. Yeah, right. th- like they, they can get after. I think Quentin Spain is a good player at guard. It's the other guard that, that, that has m- yeah, massive. Right yeah, he's got massive problems. Uh, Hakeem Adeniji, I think it. And yeah, you can get that matchup all day if you wanted to, and that's it. And like he 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 was rough against um, man. I don't even couldn't even tell you who the Raiders in tier three tech was in last week. So like, yeah, that's not a good matchup. And that's and that's a, that, that's the type of matchup that that could unravel a team like um, like the the Bengals if you stay in a situation where you're protecting the corners as well. Right. right, because that's the thing with Burrow is like the second he sees he's been so good at this over his career. Like the second he sees you are not going to be helping out the corners um, in whatever way. And I always go back to this one against this throw against uh, Clemson in the national championship game. In the I don't know if you guys know this uh, LSU won the national championship in 2019. So then what happened? <laughs> it's, uh, we don't talk about yeah, that. Yeah, we know. We never get that follow up, do we? You know, we never hear about the follow up. I haven't, I haven't watched LSU in two years. So I, I wouldn't and know. by the way, LSU football is now my mortal em- enemy. After they, you remember they dunked on me. <laughs> sure did. Oh, I remember. <laughs> They're lucky I didn't duck on them back because I could have very easily. Yeah, them. I think that for everybody's sake, we're, we're glad that yeah. <laughs> that you There's decided to be the bigger of, person. Uh, there's a uh, section of Coach O's Wikipedia page that they might not want me to read off of. Oh, is that like <laughs> one of those things with like celebrities where they say personal issues, <laughs> controversy? <Right. laughs> um, to your uh, point, Stephen, um, that I, that I kind of wanted to bounce off of that you know you kind of got jogged my mind with this whole outside zone thing. So I pulled it up while while you guys were talking and looking over the course of the season, the Titans have the second least amount of defensive stops and they're in the bottom ten in tackles for loss or no gain against outside zone. So for all this time that we're spending talking about like, Hey, can you affect the quarterback? Can you protect your corners, et cetera, et cetera. Like it might not matter if they're stuck in these two high shells because they don't feel comfortable leaving, um, leaving Jamar chase on an Island against their corners. And then you're just getting gashed by Joe Mixon. And that's been one of the things that's been kind of weird about the Bengals season is that they've been so up and down about when they can actually catch a rhythm in the run game. Like in the middle part of the season when they got cold, I think that kind of helped them evolve their their offense and their offensive approach a bit and start incorporating mixing more early in the game. And they were able to be successful. Uh, but we still see like in games against the Raiders, if they don't have it in terms of the run game and they're also not vertical in the passing game, um, this offense can be had. I think that, you know, this game is ultimately going to come down to whether or not you can keep guys like Kevin Byard up high and not in the box, right? Like, and not having to, you know, expend all your resources on stopping the run. Yeah. I, I do wonder though, if, if the Titans would be fine with Joe Mixon gashing them and are not, you not, not gashing not them, gashing, them right. leaning on the run game rather than leaning on Joe Burrow and Jamar chase, like kind of like the, 
Bill Belichick and the Giants did against the Bills in that that Super Bowl in the nineties. Uh, right. I would not be surprised <laughs> if that was the case. <laughs> okay. That's a famous game play. The game plan is literally in the Hall of Fame. I'm sorry that oh. you don't know your NFL history. Yeah, the Thurman <laughs> Thomas game, bro. All right, fine. Right. Uh, I, I think that, like, one of the issues with the Bengals, I guess we can move over to the Bengals a bit here, but, like, I think one of the issues with the Bengals is, like, they're really not a coherent offense. Not at all. They just like very like they have like different things that they do, but it's not it's not necessarily like meshed together. Um, and the glue is really Burrow and Jamar Chase. And like I said, I, I, you have to put like T Higgins in there because he does a lot of things for them as well, and, and Boyd too. But like you know, really just just Chase and, and Burrow as the glue that just like well they can just make any throw. And I that that always scares me because I think you, you you don't you give yourself a lower floor when you do that but if Burrow is is a, a superstar quarterback then then you win a lot of games right like they did this year but I think that there, there's always potential that they just say we're we're this team this week and it don't work right yeah and I think there's like a clear divide between their their run game stuff like the stuff that Zach Taylor wants to do and the stuff that Joe Burrow allows them to do Yes. I think there's a disconnect. And when I, I went back and watched the Titans games against the, uh, the Bills and Chiefs, and one thing I noticed was like two separate game plans for early downs and third downs. Like they were like a man team. They, they looked like a Fangio defense, really, on third down. And then on first down, they were doing all the, the rotated zone coverages. Mm-hmm. So if they are disjointed again on Saturday or whenever they play, I think the Titans are fully capable of like, preparing two game plans for the two separate entities of their offense. Right. Yes. I'm, Good point. I'm, I'm gupped uh, out on, on this game. So. <laughs> um, all right. So the, the, um, this game is the first one. You mentioned it is a Saturday. I'm just looking at the line so I can get your predictions on here, but I, I, I can't spell right now. All right. Bengals versus Titans line. It's three and a half. All right, three and a half. So yeah, where, where where are you putting your um where are you putting your money on this one? Uh, I'll say the Titans win, but the Bengals cover. I think it's a close game. I'm not confident in picking the Titans, but I think they're the better team. I still have zero feel for this game. I'm probably leaning in Stevens' direction, where I think that the Titans, considering that they're healthy, right? This is on the assumption that. Derrick Henry is actually like game day healthy, right? Not just like, hey, you can work out and practice and get through a day without like significant pain healthy, but actually able to affect the game. I do think that that's enough against uh, Bengals defense that I have just not been a believer in all year long to get it done. Um, But because this defense, I think they've just been kind of piecemealing this thing together the whole way, you know, investing so much into their coverages. Um, I do think that it'll be interesting to see how this game starts, but Ultimately, I expect the Bengals to keep it close. I think they'll cover, but I do expect the Titans to win. All right. Let's stay in the AFC, talk about the Bills. And Wait, the don't you make a pick? No, I don't. I just I just host the podcast. Coward. Uh, <laughs> no, of course. I'm taking the – I'm what am I, not going to take the Bengals. Uh, give me three and a half points with the better quarterback. <laughs> All right. I don't know why I did that. All right. Man is a child. <laughs> let's – Talk about the uh, the Chiefs and the Bills. Uh, I, I'm super excited for this matchup because I think it's it's been uh, you know whatever. Just you know you have two great quarterbacks. I just think like the schematics around this game are so fascinating, uh, especially on the Bills side. I think that when the Bills offense is on the field. So you know going back and rewatching that game, that was part of their the, for the Bills offense. That was them doing something that they haven't been able to do for like two years, you know, even while they've been really good on offense. And that's run the football. Yep. They ran the football. I mean, like the EPA per play is still like negative because that's just how running the football works. It's fucking dumb. But, <laughs> but they ran the football very well. And I wonder if they do. You get a bonus the- every time you, you disparage the run game from PFF. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I, I wonder if – I just wonder if you could just go into the game now that the Chiefs have 
Chris Jones in the lineup, he wasn't there, and you have uh, Melvin Ingram on on the team on that defensive line and think, hey, we're going to mash them again. Because both in the run game and in pass protection, they totally stoned the Chiefs defense. And if you go in saying, hey, we're going to try and run the full, full, run the ball again, um, kind of like they did against New England, um, you know, they put like the fullback on the field, number 41, you know, Dawson Knox is obviously on the field. Like, I don't know if that works again. Now, Josh Allen did play well when he was asked to throw the football in that Chiefs game, but so much time to throw. I mean, he was not touched at all in that game. And I just wonder if you go into that game, if, you're the, if the Bills say, hey, well, this is what we did. It worked last time against the Chiefs. It worked last week against the Patriots. Let's just do it again. I, and I wonder how much they involved Josh Allen in the run game. I, when I went back and watched that game, I noticed they ran him early on design runs, and then I think they blew the game out. And then he's, yeah. You're yeah. not going to run your quarterback. Need, they just didn't need it anymore. But that's been like a thing all year. Everyone's been like, oh, what do you, why don't you involve Allen in the run game? And I think – the theory I've been putting out there is that this is the front office that came from Carolina. They watched what that did to Cam Newton's body, and they don't want to waste those those hits on the regular season. And in big games, like the Chiefs game, they were willing to do it. They were willing to do it against the Patriots. And maybe in the playoffs, they're going to ramp up their usage of Josh Allen. And I think if that's the case, it's going to be hard for the Chiefs to stop them. I don't see how they do it, especially if Daniel Sorensen is playing a lot of uh, snaps. <laughs> that was like one of the worst games I've seen from a safety <laughs> Um, you know, the interesting thing to me is like if you look at the two teams that, that the Chiefs have played that have quarterbacks that are legitimate run threats, so the Bills and the Ravens, both of those teams ran the ball, got like 50, 50 to 58 percent of their yardage before contact. And I don't think that that's a coincidence just because of the amount of stress that it puts on the defense to have your quarterback as a run threat in general. And then when you throw in the fact that the Chiefs just don't have the best bodies in the world um, to deal with the run game. And it's obviously improved over the course of the season, um, but teams have still been able to find a lot of success, right? So that's kind of the thing I'm looking at is now that you're in the postseason, we saw what it, what it meant in the Bills game against the Patriots, that they just had Josh Allen do anything at all on the ground, right? Like Bill Belichick, a guy that we know to be as cover one dependent as there is in the NFL, clearly did not feel like he could even live in that world consistently, against a quarterback that could run the ball in a playoff game like that. And then once you get a team into those soft zone looks, that's where you that's where you run the risk of Josh Allen having that five touchdown, no interception game. So to me, I, I again this this is where I'm I'm fascinated by the matchup because I know from a personnel standpoint, the Chiefs love nothing more than to be able to play a bunch of nickel and a bunch of dime all game long, get their fastest guys on the field. You can try to hide guys like Sorensen. Um, but in a game like this, where that where trying to hide Sorensen might mean that he's responsible for the best athlete on the field, you know, and Josh Allen, like you're still kind of running into the same types of issues that I think they were when they matched up earlier in the season. But do and we think? Sorry, do the, we think they go, go? Go ahead, Steve. Go ahead. Oh no, I was just gonna say you mentioned the Ravens game going up against the Chiefs. I think that was some film that Brian Dayball watched because you you watched the first drive in the. Uh, the Chiefs Bills game, they score that touchdown. It's counter bash. And that's the right. play that the, the Ravens just started spamming in the second half to make that comeback. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see that again on Sunday. I think do do we expect so that's kind of what we expect, right? We we expect 41 on the field, we expect the fullback on the field, we expect quarterback runs. We do not expect what they did in their playoff game last year, which was four wide every play. And the and that so look, I am the Daniel Sorensen's guy. I'm gonna defend him from all the hate that he gets from everyone who comes on this podcast. But one of the reasons I said that what I said <laughs> earlier this season is because of this game in the playoffs last year, where okay, if you wanna go four wide, you know, four wide receivers, uh or or three wide receivers and a tight end, five man protection, you don't wanna run the football. All of a sudden, Daniel Sorensen becomes a linebacker. And it's like, oh, well, now we have a speed linebacker. You're not running the football. So now I can match up with the running back in the passing game. I can zone drop underneath and I don't have to, I, and, and I can like sit there and live in a world where I'm comfortable. It's when the Bills come into Arrowhead in this regular season and they force you to play, you know, nickel or base with your real linebackers on the field. And we'll we're see. We're not even sure if Willie Gay is going to play this week. Um, but like with their real linebackers on the field, and that means Sorensen is a safety 
and as opposed to a dimebacker, and he is a bad football player when he has to play safety. Uh, the PFF grades tell defending me defending actually. I looked, I looked this up recently, and like the PFF grades tell me that he is a bad football player in any position he plays. However, <laughs> I say. I say he is a good dime linebacker, and I'm sticking to it. So, yeah, anyways, I, I think that is the – and we've talked about this on the podcast before. Like, that game against the Chiefs in the playoffs and then the subsequent one, the week one game against the Steelers, if the Bills go and win the Super Bowl this year, it is because of those two games because they 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 tried different stuff. Um, since that game, in terms of being more run heavy, being more heavier personnel use, and then the thing, and it's funny because the time, some of the times that they don't want to do that, and I think the Jaguars game is is one of those games in the regular season where they just again they said, oh, we're gonna go four wide, we're gonna have five line protection, we're gonna run um, straight lines with our receivers, we're not gonna break, we're just gonna run straight lines, and you can have games where the teams just say, okay, well, we're going to play the pass on every single down. We're going right. to come with Sims and Creepers on first and second down. And and you're going to have a tough time. And Josh Allen has to be Superman. Whereas, hey, this new offense, and like I said, they rolled it out, um, you know, it, around that time, week five, uh, against the Chiefs. It, it allows them to just be a little more, and it just allows them to to, to dictate a little bit more what they want to do defenses rather than, and you don't see this a lot, but rather than defense is dictating what they're going to do to the to the Bills' offense, which we have seen this year. And I think between them, I feel like Buffalo and Kansas City had the same problem throughout this year offensively. Like teams were doing a better job of taking away the deep deep passing plays and our, mm-hmm. the crossers specifically. Right. Uh, and the Chiefs, their answer was they didn't really do anything different. Like Mahomes just started throwing underneath more often. But the Bills went like the opposite. They were like, fuck it. We're just going to throw it even deeper. Instead of running crossing routes, we're going to run posts. Right. And I think that that solution is cooler. But I also think <laughs> it's just it's better, especially with the defenses the, that they're matching up uh, uh, up against this week. Like, I am I think Sean McDermott's defense will be fine, even if Mahomes is taking those layups and check downs. They're going to rally to the ball. They're going to tackle. They're not going to miss. Ta- they're not going to miss tackles. And on the back end, they still have those two safeties and they're still going to be able to cover the deep stuff. Whereas I don't think the Chiefs necessarily have an answer to all the different things the Bills can do now on offense. So um, last little piece, you know, I, I want to swing it to the defense because I've I've been like in love with the Bills defense all year long. And, I, and I'm really interested to see how the thing's going to match up. But to follow up on what I was saying about quarterback runs. So and some of this data is obviously biased by the fact that Lamar Jackson ran the ball as much as he did in the week two game against the Chiefs in terms of like the volume of runs. But in the 47 runs where the quarterbacks involved, either, you know, in the read game and the option game, whatever it is, they're averaging like nine and a half yards per carry and over half of contact. So, like, again, like I know that, you know, we try to paint these big pictures, you know, about how teams match up. Um, but I think it ultimately comes down to like these very simple kind of matchups and things like that. And if I'm the Bills, like if there was ever a game for Josh Allen to have 18, you know, 17, 18 carries and really lead the way, this would be it. You know, especially if they are able to be successful, the Chiefs are when they're running all their 2D you know, all the Tampa two stuff and they're trying to rotate and protect against the fact that you have Cole Beasley and Dawson Knox underneath and Stefan Diggs over the top. Um, I'm really, really interested to see whether or not they're just going to force backs and just say, fuck it, we got to play cover zero all game. That's, that's what I think. In order to stop the run. I do. We, I just recorded the ringer pod. Shameless plug. That was my, that was like what I, the conclusion I came to, I was like, they should just blitz the shit out of Allen. Like, just live with the high variance plays. Allen's been one of the worst quarterbacks when blitzed. Right. So, I think that that's a reason to do it. And, like, that cover two, that, that Tampa two coverage they run where uh, Matthew ends up being, like, the middle linebacker. Like, I like that play, and it's cool, and it, like, works sometimes. The problem is that if Matthew is rotating to that spot, guess who's playing one of the Exactly. Pass? <laughs> no, let's not. Exactly. All right, let's. All right, let's. Okay, look. We don't have to get. Too negative on this podcast. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, what I'm uh, saying is Daniel Sorensen should be jailed. <laughs> All right. um, I wanted to get just uh, before we move on to the NFC games, I wanted to get um, 
I know Deontay, you had done some, you had looked at some some of the Bills' defense recently. One of the things I noticed that they can do that a lot of teams can't do. Um, well, two 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 things. Well, I guess it's one thing. Whatever. Um, they play too high, but they're very good at sticking to routes. Whether they're in zone, they do play cover two man a lot, and. They're also good at sticking to routes when they play too high, kind of their match coverage isn't too high. Yeah. And I, you know, rewatching that game and, and, and some other games that they played recently, like uh, they, they do a good job and they, they can take away, like you're getting man coverage underneath, but because they have the two high safeties, they're really good at taking away, um, taking away crossing routes. And then just, uh, you know, to add on is in that game against the Chiefs, man, they had the, Orlando Brown and uh, the other tackle, I forget who was playing in that game. It was rough. So now you're playing cover two man and you're not, or, or whatever man match stuff or zone match stuff you want to play. And Mahomes has just no time. I mean, they're getting our, uh, around the edge so easily. That was the game, I think, where I, I remember, I, I'm sure we talked about it on the podcast at the time where we were like, oh, this is not going to look good for the Chiefs going forward. And it kind of didn't. Right. Um, to me, so uh, to bounce off the first point you made, like it's the Bills and the Packers when you talk about like stickiness to routes and zone coverage, like those have probably been the two best in the NFL. To me, if you're just like watching all 22 play over play, um, their ability to kind of pass off routes and still play tight, you know, and contest the pass. Um, so that is one thing that I noticed with them. And then another thing, and I was talking to uh, Steven's colleague, Ben Solak at the ringer about what's happened with this defense since Trey White has been injured. And basically, like, the coverage profiles in terms of the share of, like, how they play middle field open to close is about the same. But one of the things that they do really well because they like to play tight to routes is protect their corners now that they don't have their number one guy. So they're playing, like, a lot of quarter-quarter halves, but it's not just soft zones where you can still take that whole shot up the sideline on a fade. Like, they're still playing with the safety hard over the top of the X receiver, the outside receiver, and their nickel basically just matching everybody up the seam. And that's something that you don't see a lot in the NFL because it's easy to just turn that coverage into two man, right? And now you've got everybody drained out up the field and your quarterback can extend the plays or whatever. But because their pass rush is as good as it's been, you know, their young guys have been good contributors. They've got a lot of speed coming off the edge. That's they a lot on of some young guys on a D line, man. Yeah. Like getting Greg Russo ended up being like a big, big deal for them um, to get like, you know, young c- contributions like that. Um, that's my concern with the Chiefs is the fact that, you know, this offensive line, I think there's been a lot of conversations about how good it is or isn't. I think that they've, you know, they've graded well for us at PFF and they've had decent games, you know, here and there, but this is a different animal to me. Um, I don't think that the Chiefs have seen a defense that plays like this in a little while. Um, and I, I think we'll get a pretty clear picture on what this is or is not in terms of how hot they've been over the last like two and a half months to end the season. Like the the closest comparison I can think of to how tight they are to routes, even in zone coverage, was last year's Rams team. Yes. Like last year's Rams defense was amazing at that, and they're they're right up there with them. It's it's really cool to watch. It's impressive. Yeah, that shit is impressive. All right, um, before we head on to the NFC side, I just want to remind the gentle listeners. Oh, I said gentle listeners. Fuck. What are you eighty? Um, <laughs> no, it's something that Kiss used to say that on him and on the Kiss and yeah, Solak show. Eighty. <laughs> Fuck. I'm turning it to Michael Kiss. Fuck. All right. Um, right now, if you go to pff.com, you can get twenty five percent off any PFF subscription with the promo code Too High T W O H I G H. All of PFF's locked article content. NFL betting dashboards for the playoffs. NFL Green Line is up twenty seven units this season. By the way. Player prop tool, uh, which shows a positive and negative value for NFL, every NFL player prop. The NFL draft guide is coming out and much, much more. Support the pod and use promo code too high for 25% off any subscription. All right, let's get on to the uh, NFC side with the Packers and the 49ers. Uh, another rematch from earlier in the season. Uh, rewatching this game, I was just like, I was surprised by how much press the 49ers played in this game against uh, obviously a pretty good receiving core or at least a pretty good receiver uh, that the Packers can try it out there. And they got burned by it a couple times. But, and this is kind of what I was saying earlier, it's like if you do the same thing again, are the same results going to happen? I don't know. Like, I, and, I, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I think like you could get away with 
press against the Packers and just be like, hey, we're going to take away everyone else who isn't Devontae Adams and like we'll live in a world where you throw a couple back shoulders to him. I, I, you know, I don't, I don't know what else is to do. Now, the other thing I did when they did play zone, I thought they were awesome in it. No bust, no nothing. Um, and it really gave the, it really gave the Packers problems. So I think there's some really good stuff that they did. And, then, and again, it's not, this is not a defense that is like, um, has been very good throughout the season. The defensive line is playing. I'm not sure Joey Bosa, uh, Nick Bosa's, um, availability. I think he did practice, um, on Thursday. So, so that, that obviously goes well for them. Obviously, on the other side, you do have David Bakhtiari back for the Packers. But, man, I'm looking at him and thinking, like, I think they can do a good job against them and just make it make it a make it an Adams versus uh, – sorry, make it an Adams and Rodgers game, like that connection, and you live and die by it. And then that's kind of what you have to do against this team. Yeah, it's like how teams – uh, the Steve Nash Suns, how sometimes they would just let Steve Nash be a scorer and not – like try to guard him so he can open up for assists. And I th- I agree. I think that's the way you have to play it. Just hope Rodgers doesn't go into God mode, which is certainly possible. Did it at the end of the last game they played against each other. But is he going to be making those throws every time? And if he, if he can't, then I think the 49ers win, especially if they win the matchup on the other side of the ball, which I fully expect them to do. Yeah, to me, like this is this is interesting, you know, hearing Seth kind of frame it this way because I think that, He's right. I do think that you have to live with the fact that, hey, if he beats you over the top to Devontae Adams or if he's on in a playoff game, you know what that means? It means you're losing anyways. So you might as well just try to take everything else away, I guess, and just try to live in that world. And then and then at that point, you're relying on your pass rush, right? You're you're relying on your pass rush to help your corners. And that's something that they've been able to do all year long. You know, we'll see what the game plan looks like without Nick Bosa. You know, I guess we'll, we'll be waiting on reports on whether or not he's able to join practice ahead of them playing in a game. You know, that'll kind of give us an idea of whether or not he'll be all right. We know that Fred Warner is OK, or at least he was able to practice, even though he's a little limited. Um but I am interested to see, like, especially on early downs, because the one thing I think you can't do is just give them those gift layup, you know, seven, eight yard gains, especially on the road in a playoff environment, because then you're putting your you're putting yourself in a position where you actually do have to put the ball in Jimmy Garoppolo's hand to keep pace. And I think if, if that happens, then it's almost guaranteed death against this Packers defense. I think you just have to you have to get the Packers out of their base offense or not out of it, but they, it can't be effective. Like that's what we saw in the, the Buccaneers games last year. And I think th- that was the team that handled the Packers the best out of any team defense that went up against them. They couldn't run the ball on the Bucks, And then Rodgers was in third and long all day long. And then Bulls was just blitzing the hell out of them. Right. I think that's what the 49ers have to do. And I think they have the players to do it. This is, I think they were second against the run in DVOA. Uh, I, Tamika Ryan's there, like you said, they're zone cover. They play zone coverage so well, so I think they can they could get the Packers out of their game on offense. I, I wonder if they they had some success. Um, Aaron Jones had some success in that game, especially I think specifically like weak side weak side runs, which is like hey, if you're going to play this type of defense, it's like over over front defense. You're going to give up the weak side B gap, and they they had some success there with Aaron Jones, obviously a good player. So I, that that would scare me if they if they. If they start running the football, then you're kind of going to have to do uh, some different things. Uh, when we flip it to the other side of the field, we're talking about with Jimmy Garoppolo. I think this is a good matchup for the 49ers offense. I think the weather, maybe if it's fucking cold outside, that that could that could hurt um, Jimmy Garoppolo. I think you know he's got the hand issue and whatever, so that might be a problem. But I think the offense, given that they're going to play against a lot of light boxes, the Packers are the most the, the, the lightest box team in the NFL. We know how good 49ers run game is. I also think in the passing game with all that stuff that's over the middle of the field and all the ways that they attack linebackers, um, high lows on linebackers, stretches, uh, horizontal stretches on linebackers, like and Devontae Campbell's had a really good season, but like that's what the 49ers do. So if they're on, like I don't, it's not a great matchup. Um, of course, the, the issue is just Jimmy Garoppolo, right? Yes. Like yeah. If he's not, if he's, if he's, if he's like bad Jimmy, then forget it. Like, as I mean, long as Jimmy doesn't shit his pants, I think they're going to score a lot of points. 
Yeah, I mean, as simple as that, right? <laughs> like, it really is as simple as that. And it's funny bringing up Devondre Campbell because that's a guy I'm looking at saying, all right, you've had a good year, but how good of a player are you actually right now? Got to find out. <laughs> yes, we'll find out very quickly. Um, Steven is the guy. <laughs> uh, I've been waiting on the, the microscope meme with Kyle Shanahan, and I, I think the Cam- I think the Campbell's the nameplate that he's got, that he's focused in on. Right if now. I did that, I would put it on, I would put justice on it. <laughs> <laughs> Packers owner Justice Mosqueda. <laughs> it's, it's so funny. The funniest thing was like Packers fans were so tired of Mike Pettin. They're like, I'm tired of Pettin. We get run on all the time. Like we play with these light boxes. And then they're like, Joe Barry is like, I mean, he does it differently, but it's the same. It's the same, same thing. Uh, it's the same issues. And they're bad, at, they're bad at stopping the run. Right. They're not, it's not like, last, like oh, last they're in light the boxes, but they're good stops. at it. Yeah, last in the right. NFL and stops, last in TFLs. Like they don't make plays mm-hmm. against the run game now. And, and I think they're going to be like weak in the flat, in the flats, just because that's like. I feel like that space that gets abandoned when you are matching coverages and stuff and like underneath, right. and I think they're going to be able to attack that. Well, and yeah, they play just, what... they just play so big up front. Like their edge guys, their outside backer types are big guys. And Kyle Juszczyk is a real athlete. George Kittle's a real athlete. Like you can take advantage of those spaces. And I don't want it to make it seem like I'm saying that this is some even matchup. I do think that the 49ers are kind of fighting uphill. No, because 100%. Of the limitations that they have at quarterback. Um, but I do think that it's going to be interesting, you know, to see whether or not that pass rush can do enough to affect the game early. And if they can get, you know, your Kittles, your use checks, you know, if there was going to be a game where those guys could get, you know, 13 to 15 touches and basically convert every third down damn near, because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of attention paid to Debo Samuel and uh, Brandon Ayuk, this would be the game where it could happen. And, and I would say that this would be a hell of a feather in the cap of Kyle Shanahan if you found a way to stay competitive in this one. Offensive. And going back to that that game, was it week two, week three? They didn't have Debo Samuel, the running back. back right. Then. Yeah. And that adds a whole new element. To, and they still had success running the ball, I think. Uh, and you should also – we need to, like, talk about Kyle Shanahan's history against this defense. Like, even last year when the 49ers were outmatched by the Rams – they beat them both times and they were did whatever they wanted on offense. And they used Debo as running back. I think it was in the second matchup. Mm-hmm. So I could see him having a big day on the ground too. Uh, when we obviously remember the NFC Championship game from two years ago where <sighs> they ran the ball as Beautiful. good as anyone's like ever ran the football. Um, they put what's his face, my favorite linebacker in the Alec Martinez in the Shandy scope, and it was <laughs> your favorite linebacker. You don't even know his name. It's Blake Martinez. Blake Martinez. <laughs> Did I say Alec Martinez? Yes. Who is like, Alec Martinez? Oh, you cha- Alec Martinez like you changed his the... nationality and everything. Like <laughs> Alec Martinez is a hockey player, so right. we don't talk a lot. We're gonna start talking. I I said this to myself. I wanted to tell you, Deontay. Um, you talked about. You tweeted about like how um, some sort of basketball concept, pick and roll, has similarities to football concepts. The second, the se- I swear to God, the second you start doing that, I'm bringing up, oh my God, we're talking about zone exits, we're talking about zone entries, oh we're talking about power play units. Like, I'm but, just telling you. You know the difference between me talking about basketball and you talking about hockey in relation to football? I'm bringing up a sport that people watch. <laughs> What a chance it's to win the Sam, ultimate Sam, game day feast, whether it's football success or financial savvy. <laughs> would you like winning starts with asking us questions? Would you like to know what it's like behind the scenes with Al Michaels and Sunday Night Football? How about a need to know for your financial future? Western and Southern is teaming up with PFF's very own Chris Collinsworth to share insights that can help put you ahead on both your financial and fantasy scoreboards. Every submission earns you a chance to win the ultimate feast to celebrate your football's favorite Sunday. We'll cover your catering up to $2,500. Coordinate your order from a restaurant near you and have it delivered on February 13, 2022. And don't forget to check out the Chris Collinsworth podcast and Western and Southern's Instagram for answers to the best questions each week. Submit your questions at westernsouthern.com slash feast. One more time, that is westernsouthern.com slash feast. If you're watching on YouTube, check out the link in the description below. All right. Wait, wait, wait. I want to call you out on your bullshit. Because you just said that about Deontay, about him bringing up basketball. Like you didn't record that video about the Bills offense and comparing it to how defenses were like playing them like soccer teams and like closing the lines. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh-huh. So you already did that with a, another sport that not a lot of Americans watch. All right. But hockey is is is, is Good dodge there, Steven. Soul. Steve, Steven with the elaborate dodge. <laughs> your your old right. Twitter was, go, was about to burn him alive. No, well, I, I like <laughs> soccer, so I, I didn't want to disparage the sport. 
Steven, let's talk about uh, your latest football manager save. Where are you? Uh, have you won the Champions League yet? No, I haven't. I, uh, not, I haven't played in a couple of weeks, so I, for, I already forgot. Oh, I'm Anderlicht. I'm playing in Belgium. Uh, we're off to a good start. I'm still in year one. All right. Last but not least, another rematch. Rams and Buccaneers. Uh, I this is I think hopefully going to be the highest scoring game of the weekend. I think Chiefs and Bills have a chance to do that too, but I'm just looking for excitement. And the one thing, the only thing I have really to say about this game, um, just off the top of my head, is you know watching the Rams offense and watching the 49ers offense. It's, tell me why not every team in the league runs those swirl routes underneath those like whip in whip out routes that always get open. And are always a great outlet for um, you know both quarterbacks in those systems. Like I, I don't even get it. even the, even the Fleur doesn't really run them that much coming from the same system. But like uh, it's like a cheat code that no one else wants to run. Is these? I know it's like a small part of their offense, but I swear every time it's they're they're always open. Well, is it always open because it's a good player? Or are they always open because it's Cooper Cup running the route? I see. I see like all these all these Forty Nineers like Juszczyk I guess. Can't speak. You check running it and like all those people. It, it is partly you just because br- of Cooper. You just Cup. brought up another one of like the t- 25 <laughs> most talented players in the league. All right, Deontay, you wrote about the Rams' offense and and you know specifically, I think um, the Rams on third down, the Rams in the fourth quarter, like clutch situations. What did you see uh, when you put on the film? Well, I think that we all kind of recognize the fact that the whole ethos of this team is to rely on its stars to get the job done. Like, and they've obviously, you know, they've had some cold spells offensively and by cold, I mean, just like not blowing teams away. We've obviously like seen some bad turnovers from Matthew Stafford. Like I do have to recognize that. Um, And that's been an issue for them. But if you're judging them by like key situations, right? Like, are you actually able to be effective when, you know, the pressure is highest or when you're in obvious passing situations, right? Like you see an offense that's around, if not the best in the league at managing those scenarios. Or like Matthew Stafford has been very accurate and aggressive. It's not just checking the ball down and expecting guys to get first downs on yards after the catch. He's able to push the ball down the field. Um, this offensive line is still concerning to me in terms of protection, especially on the interior. Um, but when you talk about being able to make those plays in those situations, like I'm interested in seeing what this looks like against the Bucks defense that wasn't even tested a little bit like this in the wild card round. Right? Like this is going to be a an almost kind of like polar opposite approach offensively um to me so that's the first thing i'm looking at in terms of stafford and then obviously you're talking about like i got like cooper cup being maybe like the most unstoppable third down receiver in the nfl right now short of justin jefferson who might be the best receiver in the nfl right now um you know his ability to get open underneath he can play in that intermediate area he's a yards after catch threat you can throw in the ball on basically any route on the route tree and you can rely on him to get things done and when you put all those pieces together you have an offense that does what you need to do in playoff games, right? Scoring on opening drives, score or being able to convert on third down, punching the ball in in the red zone. Um, you know, those are the big things. And then obviously performing well on the road. That's something that they've done as well. Um, so that's that's kind of what I'm looking at in terms of this matchup. It's about the stars. And I think I'm feeling pretty confident about where the Rams stand in terms of their star players. I think that. The game against Arizona last week was one of their best, if not their best game by an offensive line, by their offensive line. Stafford had all sorts of time, and obviously the game ended in, the, in at halftime, but like he had all sorts of time to throw the football, getting to the backside digs, waiting for routes to come open. It was really that that's what they get that type of performance. There's the sky is really the limit for this team, right? Don't we love a backside dig? Is there a better dude? It's football? so funny. It, it's so funny that Cleveland people were like, Beckham, where is he? Where is he? Where is he? Well, he's running all these backside digs that Baker Mayfield is not throwing. And now he's on a team where Stafford the quarterback is his backside digs. Yeah. Brave enough to throw the ball late in the progression. And there you go. And now here he comes again. And he's and he's showing that he's that he's still a really, really good, really good receiver. I, it feels like the Rams offense has kind of found that perfect middle ground between the golf offense and what they were running at the beginning of the year before their struggles. And like, I know I, I, I've seen like the nerds on Twitter be like, when a, anyone suggested maybe they should do more of the stuff they were doing with golf, they're like, Oh, oh they're the same quarterback. Like you, Oh, you need to do the same thing for Stafford. Cause he's not as good as you guys thought. 
but it's like a different reason why they need it. They want to run that the under center and play action stuff on those early downs. It's, I don't know. It's just another tool in the toolbox. Whereas for Jared Goff, it was all he could do. Right. They couldn't do the other stuff. But it works. Like the under center play act and stuff just works. So you should be running more of it. I was surprised they didn't run more of it earlier in the year. But now that they are, I mean, I think this is, I think they're going to make the Super Bowl. I'm ready to say that wow. they're going to make the Super Bowl. And I don't think this game is going to be competitive. They're my, wow. they're my pick. I'm picking them and the Bills to play in the Super Bowl. And like that, that's where I'm at with it. I mean, the one thing that I will say that really makes me feel confident is that apparently Cam Akers can go from tearing his Achilles in the summer and look like one of the better running backs in the NFL by the following January. Like, and if they have, obviously, I mean, dealing with the Bucks, you're talking about the best run defense in the league, basically. So it's not like I expect him to run the ball or move the ball on the ground the way that they did against the Cardinals, who we know are, is not the best run defense in the NFL. Um, but having that to add to what they've been able to do in the passing game, I'd I feel really good about where the Rams stand right now, particularly in this matchup um, where Tampa Bay can't just ignore 75% of the field on a given pass play. And I, I feel like we saw some weaknesses with the, the Bucks passing game last week on third down and yes. against man coverage. It's not like the Eagles have like lockdown man corners either. Like the, yes. I think Brady was like zero EPA per play against man and like 0.23 against zone. And I think that's a direct result of, losing Chris Godwin and losing Antonio Brown. It becomes a lot easier to play man coverage against them now. Like, if all I have to do is worry about Mike Evans and, and a washed-up Gronk, like, I can do that, and the quarterback can't move. And you're telling I mean, me I mean, that your best tackle is in a walking boot leading right. up to the game? That's the scariest thing for me. Going up against Von Miller? Yeah. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> like, can, can they can – they, work their way down the field like they did against the Eagles throwing three yard passes against the Rams. Right. That's the key. Cause I think that's, I, 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 I would like, they, they know they can't do that. Like I know that they know they can't do that, but I wonder if they're just like, well, what else, what, what else is left? Do we have, yeah, what else is if, left? If worse is not playing and obviously the receivers are decimated like that, we know I like that's, that's tough for me. Um, you can just always get a Gronk game. That's what that, that's the thing. Like we, they don't have great linebackers. He's a matchup problem for uh, pretty much anyone uh, in the with the safeties and the uh, the linebacker core with the Rams. Um, so that you can always get a good Gronk game. You could even even get a good Mike Evans game. Um, but uh, the nice thing about the Rams is they can put Jalen Ramsey wherever they want. Like they have no problems. Obviously, we know this from last year. The whole star thing. Blah blah blah. Like. They'll put him wherever, and if you can travel with Mike Williams and we we my, sorry Mike Evans, Christ, if um, we saw this, um, you know me and you Deontay talked about this after the Saints game. If you can handle Mike Evans with one player, and the Saints do it every year with with Marshawn Lattimore, you have an opportunity to snuff out this Bucks offense, and it's especially without Antonio Brown and 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 even more without uh, Chris Godwin. Yeah, that's why I don't I don't think this game is going to be competitive. I I really don't, especially unless like it's just like a terrible Matthew Stafford game, which is very possible, or Todd Bowles is blitzing and it's working and they're getting to Matthew Stafford. But on both sides of the ball, and if you look up like the history between Todd Bowles and Sean McVay when they've gone head to head, like it is totally one-sided towards Sean McVay, which makes sense because He's going to attack you in his base offense, and the the Bucks are going to play their their base three four and, and ask an edge rusher that's usually used to rushing the passer to drop into like the curl flat area. And I think McVay is just going to take advantage of that all day. Especially and that and Devin White, who I think you can definitely get going one way and then throw the ball the other way. All right, Stephen Ruiz, tell the people where they can find you. Uh, you can find me on outkick.com and Breitbart. <laughs> no, uh, you can find me at The Ringer. The Ringer and uh, No, I want your address. So give the people your address. Where can they li- where can they physically find you? I tweeted it out. <laughs> uh, now you can find me at uh, on Twitter at the Stephen Ruiz. Stephen with a V, the proper way to spell it. All right. Uh, this was the Two High Podcast, and we will see you guys next week.